Advisory Management, MVPs, um, different times of uh, fundraising rounds. But really at the core of any business is the idea that you have a product or a service that you think is somewhere in, in the world and that you think that it will benefit their lives. If you don't believe in that, it doesn't matter how much money you'll make, you won't be able to last in the long run. Um, so we'll begin here. How many of you have, how many of you know where Yemen is on the, on the map? Okay, that's more than I expected. Great. Uh, it's located in the Middle East. Um, and in the, the Middle East, when we hear that term, it's usually something negative. A suicide attack, deserts, Al-Qaeda. Um, and so, something like this. Let me see this. Oh, I think it's a little big here. Well, I'll just go through this part. Oh, but it's actually so small. Yeah. So, let's see here. Folks, some good has come from the latest attack on America. We now have a new place to fear. Jim? Is Yemen the new front in the war on terror? New threats being posed by Yemen. The story also puts Yemen on the map for a lot of folks. Yemen. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, for the most part. Uh, and so when, uh, when a lot of times we don't understand certain cultures, we have negative assumptions on things. My family comes from Yemen. And like a lot of you here probably, uh, I felt like I was uh, somewhat of a bridge. And so, uh, people who have roots and ancestries in different countries, but also born here and like you know, pop culture and like food, and like movies here. And so, most of the times, people immigrate out of these countries that are in conflict to find a better life. And they don't necessarily have the idea of going back. So, when I told my parents, you know, I had this idea of going back to Yemen, to become a farmer, or a coffee, they, they thought I was joking, they didn't take me seriously. And then when I actually physically went to Yemen, they were very concerned and worried about me. Uh, for a while, I thought it was a phase. You know, that few months became a year, and then here I am today. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about history. Um, I won't bore you too much, but it's important to understand uh, where things come from. And in any business, it's very vital to understand that. You're not the first person who's tried to do something. And you can take a lot of examples from things, even other things other than yourself other industries and possibilities, and get inspiration from that. Um, a lot of times you, I, I'll, you'll find that somebody in a different industry faced an obstacle, uh, whether it's 50 years ago or 100 years ago, and then you can actually look at that obstacle and how they overcame it, and derive knowledge to use uh, with your, in your product or your, or your business. And so if, you're, if you love history, I think that would always be for your benefit. And so coffee begins somewhere here. This is called the Eastern Afro-Monte region. It's a diversity hotspot that connects East Africa and the South part of Yemen. No one knows where coffee begins exactly. Um, stories say that it comes from either Ethiopia or Yemen. And so, uh, just to race through this uh, slide, this is my longest slide, but I think it's very valuable to know. Um, so, for those who don't know, there is a city in Yemen called Mocha. It's a port, port of Mocha, which is the name of my company. And coffee trade began there around the 1400s. Uh, and so the people of Yemen, my ancestors, found this plant and they cultivated it. And they saw it had a lot of benefits. They saw it was a very st spiritual drink. A lot of Sufi monks liked to drink coffee. It helped them elevate their senses uh, and stay up for night prayers. And it spread really quickly from Yemen through Mecca to Egypt. Uh, in the 1500s, Cairo, Egypt, had over 3,000 coffee houses that sold single origin coffee from Yemen. And then uh, eventually the first company to begin working in Yemen, first Western company, was the Dutch VOC company, the East Indian company, uh, which is a very, has a lot of negative history. That's the, country, the company that most of the West Atlantic slave trade happened to. And so they saw this, this thing was a valuable commodity. Uh, they began to business order. 
The Yemenis are very smart, and so they refused to sell any green beans that weren't baked or boiled, so that the embryo in the bean would die and you couldn't grow it again. It was like an earlier form of Monsanto, <laughs> that joke, um, to make it proprietary, which is a very important word to learn. It's really important. If you can control something, in, in whether a product, a service, a technology, and have the rights to it, uh, you have a monopoly on that market. Uh, so anyone who sold green seeds to foreigners would be executed at that time. So the port of Malta quickly became a very important part of the world. Uh, the year later, the uh, French uh, set up a shop there, and then the British East India Company began to trade there. And so uh, there was a really interesting trade network that happened in that time period. Eventually, uh, a story goes that the Dutch spies were able to steal seven seeds out of Yemen. First, by a Sufi from <coughs> India named Baba Badul, who came to Yemen, loved coffee, and smuggled seven in his underwear. Um, he set up a, uh, plantations in, in, in southern India, and he has a shrine there until today. But the Dutch were the first to take it and make it cold in India. And they took it to their colony in Indonesia, uh, on the island of Java. And that's where the name Java comes from. So Java and Mocha, Mocha, these ancient places that began to export coffee. Um, and some of you here, have you heard of Kopi Gulak? I rest a little bit. Have you heard of Cat Poop Coffee? <laughs> yeah, it's like this, this really rare coffee, is supposedly that this, this uh, animal is a civic, it's like a weasel called the Luwak. And it's located in Indonesia and also in Vietnam. And it basically eats the cherries, coffee cherries, and it shits out. Beans, and they collect it. So in that time period, it was illegal for the local Javanese people to drink coffee. The Dutch exported all the coffee out. And the only coffee they were allowed to drink was what this animal shitted out. <laughs> Centuries later, the city to market that as a rare product. And now it's sold as one of the most expensive coffees in the world. Um, coffee that's really good. What's worse actually is this coffee, it doesn't taste good. So I, I had to become a certified coffee taster, which you'll learn later, what I had to go through to do that. And as a certified coffee taster, objectively, it's, it's not good at all. Uh, what's worse is that these animals are first force fed and put in cage, cages and they're treated horribly. Uh, one of my mentors, George Howell, was a really wonderful coffee company in Boston, George Howell Coffee. He says it's coffee from assholes for assholes. <laughs> Going back, so when coffee left Yemen, unfortunately, anywhere it was grown, local people were, were enslaved and exploited for growing. Um, so when they went from Indonesia, the Dutch gave one tree to the French. Uh, the French, a man named Gabriel de Clou, in 1721, took seed cuttings from that across the Atlantic Ocean. On his voyage, he either robbed by, by Tunisian pirates, and then they got lost at sea. He began to ration out a lot of his water supply for this plant he had in a glass container. Uh, they thought it was crazy, but eventually that they made it to the Caribbean, to the island of Martinique, uh, from there to Haiti. That one plant that went from France to the Caribbean is called the noble tree. And 90% of the world's coffees trace their roots back to that one plant. Uh, from there, the, the, eventually the Haitian people began to grow coffee in Haiti. And when they fought for their liberation and self-determination from the French, the French burned most of their crops. And so they took it to Central and South America. Now uh, Brazil produces almost a third of the world's coffee production. From seeds from the Caribbean, from one tree in France, and seven seeds from Indonesia, from Yemen. And so in, in biology, this is called bottleneck genetics. So in the entire world of coffee, there are 66 to 70 countries that can grow coffee. It can be grown everywhere, not in Europe or Central America, or, or North America. Uh, North America. And in these countries, there is only 1.2% of genetic diversity of varietals of coffee. And when I say a varietal, in, in, in apples, we have these different types of varieties. Granny Smith, Pink Lady, Washington Red, and so, and each one is different. It has different tastes. So in coffee, we have different types of varietals. One called Tipica, Bourbon, Gesha, Hatuai. Uh, and so in this in these countries, there's only 1.2% diversity, except for Yemen and in Ethiopia. We have hundreds of unknown varietals. That's one of the reasons why our coffees are very unique. Uh, also, it's interesting, when coffee went to, to Europe and North America, 
in these coffee houses, it was the first time people had public discourse about any class separation. So you'll notice the French, American, and Russian revolutions all happened in coffee houses. The Boston Tea Party was planned in the Green Dragon Coffee House in Boston. And ideas flourished. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, amazing things that happened there. Coffee now is one of the most traded commodities on the way. It's a huge market. It's a $70 billion market right now. The US is the largest consuming uh, country. And in the world of coffee, there are two types of markets, commercial and specialty, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the specialty market accounts for less than 10% of the global volume of coffee. It's small. But dollar-wise, in the US, it's over 51% of the monetary spend on coffee. What it is, is people like the traceability of it. They like to know where the coffee is grown, uh, grown uh, what elevations, what variety is it. They like the blueberry notes that come from Ethiopian coffees, or the chocolate <coughs> notes from Guatemalans, or the earthy tea notes that come from Indonesians. Um, and so people look for these kind of varieties. Some go on auction for ridiculous prices. One of these coffees uh, from Panama, it's a variety called Geisha, or Geisha. And it sold uh, two months ago for $600 a pound, equating to $55 per cup. Um, and so it matters a lot that you can differentiate uh, that product, that variety. Why is MD coffee special? A lot of reasons, but for the most part, the genetic diversity is where it's grown, the elevation. The higher coffee is grown, the slower it matures, and the more sugars and acids it develops. Quick fun fact caffeine. Caffeine is actually a self-defense mechanism or, or, or a chemical that the coffee plant produces to kill off insects and, um, and so at low elevations you always have more caffeine. Uh, and, and the higher you go, the less caffeine there is because it's harsher to live and colder. So higher grown coffees grow slower, they have less caffeine, they're less bitter, and they have more natural sugars. Our coffees, because they're, they're, they're growing at some of the highest points in the world, they have usually half the caffeine, but double the natural sugars. Um, and then the unique microclimates. You don't have much water in them. And so if you, if you like wine, you know that grapes that are stressed produce sweeter wines. And the same phenomenon happens with our coffee trees. Um, and so basically, I, my trajectory was I was, this is actually one of the villages we work in Yemen. So it's hard for me to explain to you what Yemen is like. Uh, but I, this picture gives you an idea of how beautiful and really magical the landscape and the people are. Uh, these villages are, are hundreds and hundreds of years old. This one's about 800 years old. And they, they're on the top of the mountains for defensive purposes. And they like look down at the clouds and have these beautiful terraces where they grow their food and their coffee. Um, when I started this project, I was pretty set on going to law school. Actually, I really wanted to go to Bolt. And I worked as a paralegal doing immigration work uh, law. And everything I did was around law. I, I interned at the Asian law office, in the ACLU. I did a lot of civic engagement work. My goal in life was really I wanted to do something of, of social impact. And it's really important for us to understand and to figure out what is your why? What do you want to do? It's hard sometimes to explain who you are. Uh, but when you figure out what that is, that bottom line, whatever you do, it's going to go back to that. So I knew, I realized I wanted to do something of social impact. And I thought being a lawyer would be great. You know, law school sucks, super expensive. It's, you know, do I want to spend the rest of my life up behind a desk filling out paper? But I know that I could be a tool for my community, helping people, um, and that's what I wanted to do. And then I had a cup of coffee from a coffee shop, it was a cup from Ethiopia. And at that time I had never had good coffee before. The only coffee I knew was some crappy coffee from like a diner and it was really burned and you had to put a bunch of cream and sugar in it just to make it taste better. But this coffee tastes like blueberries. <coughs> and so I started to learn more about specialty coffee and understanding it. And I started going to these coffee shops, in particular Blue Bottle. Um, that was when I first started to get into coffee about four years ago. Before that, I, I really did drink coffee. Um, and so when I had that cup of coffee, I, said, I realized that I saw this as a really amazing model for social impact. Essentially what you do is you teach people how to produce something better, and then you find the right markets for it. There's a product, there's, there's a supply chain, and at the end there's a market for it. Um, and so that's what I thought I could do. Uh, 
Um, I didn't know much about especially the coffee community, or the, the commercial market prices, or how it fluctuates based on global warming, and how I didn't know much about that, but I knew I wanted to do that. So I began to surround myself around highly educated people in coffee. I began to read books about coffee, go to conferences, everything was coffee. There's a point where something goes from being a hobby to being something that you want to do. You, you don't have asset. You just have like, this is what I'm going to do. And one of my mentors, I was talking to him, he's like, what are you doing right now? I said, well, I'm going on majoring in you know, philosophy and rhetoric, and I want to you know, go to law school, but I think I want to do this, you know, figure this out. He's like, no. If you're going to do it, you got to do it. And you're going to have two scenarios. Best case scenario, you have a thriving company, you make a bunch of money, and you, you love what you do. Worst case scenario, you live your life doing what you do, and you're happy with what you do. And so, for me, I thought, okay, I can do that. That was better than what I, that was what I wanted to do. Uh, and so, at the time, like I had didn't have much understanding about finances or like fundraising or even coffee. So I began first learning about becoming a master in that field. Learn about it. Build yourself into it. Go to conferences. You know, and I became like really hungry. Everywhere I went, or in my case, Thursday. Everywhere I went, I learned about. I began to go to Blue Bottle. They had these public companies every Sundays. I would go there and like I eventually I became like this annoying assistant. Um, and from there, three months later, I'm, I was in four months, I was in Yemen. And so I I had an idea. I had these reports on coffee production in Yemen. And I went to 32 different regions across Yemen. Um, and this is a video of like one of these beautiful places I took on my iPhone. So if you look over, these are all coffee trees, those are terraces. Um, for a second. It's pretty amazing seeing like that people can do that and they produce that. I mean, so the, these are those coffee terraces over there. That's a that's a village on top right there, and that's me trying to look like brown Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I actually lost forty pounds in the first four months doing this. I had to track of the malaria and tapeworms, gallbladder stones, but that's a different. <laughs> um, but yeah, in, in the process, like I would go to these areas and I learned. I didn't. Some places I would go to, there was a single coffee tree, and I would ask the locals, I'm like, "Do you guys have coffee?" Like, "Yeah, we used to have coffee, like you know, 50, 60 years ago. A little late." And some places were like really amazing. I saw these coffee like paradises, these thousand-year-old villages, and the people were so beautiful, wonderful. Um, and I got to meet with them, hear their stories. Yes, I wrote down things like data points, like the elevation, the harvest patterns, the price points. But I got to see the people, meet them, understand them. And, and it's really important to have connections with people. Um, and so, and I took back samples. I took back 21 samples from these different regions. Uh, at that time, no one had done that before. How many were always mixed in the weird, you know, had, had like an ambiguous name. And no one knew where exactly it came from. Um, and there's all these crooks and thieves and weird things all along that chain, from the producer who made it to, uh, to the consumer who drank it. And it's a really miraculous journey. A coffee tree produces about a pound of coffee per year, about 25 pounds. And, it, and it's these charities. It's a charity picket, and there are two bees inside it. And it takes a lot of hard work to pick coffee cherries by hand, especially if you want ripe red cherries. So I'll go through this process with you guys. But Take them back to this coffee lab. Okay, so to become a coffee taster or a coffee sommelier, I'll show you guys this right here. It's a 22 part exam to understand coffee. And so I was like, coffee is taste, it's subjective. Why? How could you do like how can I do? But what, what it does is it, it objectifies it for you. It's a language you learn. Uh, so like one of my exams, I had to memorize 36 smells for coffee. I had to learn the organic acids found in coffee, the rose profiles, 16 visual defects, different origins. And you, and you go through this process and then you begin to understand more about this stuff. And so the, it's out of a 100 point system. Each um, uh, section, you have fragrance, and aroma, flavor, aftertaste, acidity, balance, body. You have increments of 0.25, so 7, 7.25, 750, 7, 7, 8. And you write down your scores. And it's in blind cuppings. What we call these Jason's cuppings. So it's blind. So when I first did this, I remember I walked into a room and people were talking about it. And it's like you have to have like a, like a poker face. You can't be serious. You can't influence the person next to you. So if I said I taste chocolate, 
right away someone who is like, oh, I teach coffee too. So I remember you, you, after you finish, you go over and you start talking about the coffee. And I still remember like the first day I walked into one of these tastings, uh, they were saying, oh, there was just describing what didn't sound like coffee. They were saying, yeah, this coffee, so girls like, it tastes like pink starburst. This other person was like, yeah, it has a hint of like maybe carrots. And this, this guy, I, I kid you not, he looked at me and he said, this coffee tastes, uh, tastes a little passive aggressive. <laughs> he looked at me, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. But I'm like, this is, I don't understand what they're talking about. And I didn't know. So. In short, there are three things your, your tongue tastes, sometimes four. Salty, sour, sweet, sometimes bitter. So it's a bit salty, or if it's sour, or if it's sweet. Is it like a sour? Is it like a green apple sour? Or lemon sour, or is it battery acid sour? Sweet. Is it a fruit sweet or a chocolate? Okay, it's a fruit. Is it a citrus fruit or a melon? Or is it citrus? Is it tangerine or mandarin? Are you, you forget you begin to like really start to find these fine things. It's a concord grape. It's a ghostberry. You know, um, and so it's a, it's pretty amazing when you realize that. And I remember the first time I, I had this like I understood this language. I was with my teacher Jody, and she was going through this coffee. And we finished scoring it, you know, and she was blind, and she was by herself, and I, I wrote down my scores, and I wrote down the, my notes. Uh, floral notes, like a jasmine flower, maybe it's a Columbia geisha. So uh, geisha type of variety. And she was like, and I looked at hers, in every box we had the same exact score, except in one box, we had, we were off by 0.25. So like 7, 7.5, 8, 0.25, 9, 9.75, like it was, so it wasn't a coincidence. You know, these are 10 boxes. And she wrote floral, jasmine, uh, I said calumet, she said it was a Panama geisha. Same variety in the neighboring country. So that's when I realized I understood this, like, this language. So now I can actually learn about my product when I go back to him. So we went and we, we tasted these coffees. Oh, by the way, this is how it sounds. Um, you, you're supposed to slurp it really aggressively. <laughs> I always say the more your mother would disapprove, the better. <laughs> and it looks like this. Sound like <laughs> 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 so it's funny, like millions of dollars of coffee is being evaluated there. This is actually a blue bottle in Oakland. Um, and so when we did this with my with my 21 samples, I was like super excited about these coffee samples. 19 failed basic standards. So it's out of 100 points. Especially coffee is considered 80 points in a book. To give you an idea, like like peas and Starbucks aren't even, or fills, they're not 80. Blue bottle will sell like a, a 85 point coffee. 80, so 80 points is a really special thing. 85 is, is an amazing, amazing coffee. And then 90 plus is like ridiculous. And it's very, very rare and you won't taste that often in your life. And so um, 19 failed basic standards. Actually, well, um, guy here with the, the metal, he, he called some of them DOA, death on arrival. Um, they just had a bunch of funky smells and tastes and all these defects happening because the way it was processed and picked it was all incorrect. But two of them, they didn't just do good, they were 90 plus. Some of the most rare and most expensive coffees in the world. And so I realized, okay, I, I have something here that's, that, that's good. Um, and so I went back to Yemen and I took more samples from those areas. Um, those two same farmers actually. And the coffees were horrible. So I realized the way it was the whole system was arbitrary and random and there was no structure and so the result was always going to be random. And so I had to figure out a supply chain and figure out a system that made sense. Um, and so these are coffee cherries by the way. They should not be picked like this. They start off green and as they mature they become yellow and when they're, when they're fully ripe they're red and they're very sweet. Uh, and you're supposed to wait. And so the farmers were picking them different colors because nobody was paying them more for them better quality of picking. It's a lot of labor to pick these red cherries too. <coughs> so I remember I told, one of the, I told one of the farmers, if I paid you more money, would you pick these red cherries for me? And he said, if you paid me more money, I would pick rainbow colored cherries for you. <laughs> <laughs> and they dry it. So they dry it on the rooftops, which looks nice in these pictures. But there's, there's dirt and gravel, it's uneven. You know, Modern countries, like, and they have these raised driver systems that have airflow, they have moisture meters that check the moisture level, and then chickens poop here. So a lot of weird things happen. Then they store the coffee for less time for 
you're supposed to begin processing the coffee in machines and, and separating the beans out right away. They store them sometimes for five years because it's a type of currency, the cash crop. And some Yemeni coffee has like a tobacco defect taste to it. Um, this is where it comes from. <laughs> Hi, William. This is how we talk in Yemen. <laughs> That's where the flavor is like infused, the tobacco flavor. So all along the chain, things are happening. There's there's there are, there are um, loan sharks that give territory loans to farmers to take advantage of them. This cycle of debt that happens. People are not being paid enough for better quality coffee. People are, are mixed in different regions. They're not. They're not every region is, should be separated. It finally gets to the mill, and it's the guy. This guy is smoking cigarettes and he's chilling all on top of it. Uh, so yeah, what I would do is I would go into these like. So in Yemen, there's a. How many of you have heard of a drug? It's going to East Africa and Yemen called Qat, Cat or Chat. Qat is a categorized as a category one drug in the U.S. by the FDA. It's an amphetamine. But I think it's more of a, of a, of a moderate stimulant. Um, and basically in Yemen, for every one coffee farm, there's seven of these drug farms. The problem with Qat, and why I have an offense with it, is that it takes up almost 40% of Yemen's water resources. And in the beginning, people didn't grow it. It's not like it wasn't grown as a commercial product. You know, people brew coffee and wheat and barley. But basically, uh, in the last 20 years, it's become this crazy cash crop. <laughs> Similar to opium in Afghanistan, poppy seeds. So every one coffee farm, there are 20 of these drug farms. And so it, it ruins the water, it, it ruins the economy, you can't export it, and it takes away from things that can be exported and can be produced like coffee. So after lunch, the entire country basically shows out in these class sessions. People talk about life and love and politics. And Whatever. Um, I would wait about 30 minutes or so in the <coughs> chemical cathinine called until it hits their bloodstream. And I had this like Braveheart speech I rehearsed. So I'll tell them the history of coffee and how it came to the world and what it can do, and then I'll bring it back to reality and tell them nobody cares about you now. These NGOs come, they take these photo ops with you, and they make millions of dollars and give you nothing. There's no roads here, no Christy, and no one can help you unless you help yourselves. For me, I really believe as a social entrepreneur that sustainability is very important. And the best way is to help pe people empower themselves. That's the best way to do things. Um, and that's the problem with NGOs, that they don't create that system. And so what happens when NGO fund stops, people are devastated. They're used to that income coming in artificially. And so I decided that, no, I want them to empower themselves, to help themselves. Um, and so I would go and I would talk to these different farmers. And a lot of the really amazing ideas happen in these sessions, but there's not much retention the next day. So I realized there were three things that, I mean, this is probably general in, in life, for is this to work? The, the potential for greatness. Whatever product you have, or service, or also coffee trees, there were certain varieties that really were really amazing and remarkable. So I looked for those varietals, certain elevations, certain pH level in the soil. The second is really difficult, and that's people's willingness to change and try something different. And the third is the idea of more collectively. And that's, you need to be able to communicate that as a, you know, as a leader or as a potential vision. So I began to educate farmers in classrooms along with, in the supply chain. What is the right charity? You know, why should you take it? You know, and over and over again, this kind of work. Um, most of them have never even tasted their product. It's very sad. A lot of countries that produce things, they don't know how the end product is. And like most of at West Africa, 80% of chocolate comes from West Africa. And most cacao producers don't know how chocolate tastes like. It's really sad. And so in my case, they didn't know how their coffee tasted. So here they had theirs, a Sumatran and an Ethiopian. And I asked them which one do you guys like the most. This was completely blind. And they all picked their coffee. Uh, this is, I probably had like one of the only Chemexes in Yemen. So this is one of my favorite pictures of them. They're just watching me make it with my, like, this pour method, like my hand grinder, and my scale. I got to take farmers to Ethiopia because I, I would show them pictures of how coffee was produced there. And they, would, they didn't think it was real. So I worked with an NGO to take some farmers to Ethiopia to, to learn about coffee production there. Um, it was pretty cool to do that, and they took notes and the idea of being sustainable. Then we started building the first drying bed system in Yemen. That's General Hamid. He's a badass. Um, <laughs> he became the head of production for drying beds. He used to build tanks, um, and so repair tanks. And so the, these were the first drying beds, the ways to easily dry it and cover it from the, some the rain. And then they began to copy, copy like this. You know, I never thought coffee chairs can be picked that way in Yemen. Um, and so, 
along this time, I'm sending samples to the lab here and cupping them, tasting them, and a lot of some success. Unfortunately for me, like there's a lot of like setbacks in business, and in my case, it was pretty difficult. Um, where there's a political reality to everything we produce, we wear someone who makes his phone, or it's sad that a lot of people are exploited. You know, people are committing suicide in China building phones for us, or being paid nothing in Bangladesh to produce our clothes, or even coffee. Coffee should not be a dollar, or even two dollars. That price point, you're drinking someone's labor, and for them to produce it at that price point means that someone is being exploited. Unfortunately, it's always the producer. Um, and so, in my situation, it was a political reality. Yemen was very unstable, and still is an unstable country. And I chose not to see the things that were happening around me because I had this vision of like, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to make it work. But on March 25th, I was supposed to go to a coffee conference in Seattle. And it was the biggest coffee <coughs> um, I was supposed to showcase, showcase the, the work of the farmers there. And it was a marketing opportunity for me. And so when you have a product, especially this new kind of product, when you come into the market, it's interesting. I, sometimes like, I, I, I try to think, is it, is it important to have a better product or service, or is it better to have better marketing? And I always lean to the product first. You have to have the product. Uh, but if you have the marketing, and you don't have to target your consumer who they are, you can do really well. And so, I mean, look at Taco Bell. I think it's disgusting, <coughs> but they're doing well. They know how to talk to their consumer. Uh, it's very important to understand who your audience is and what, well, who's buying your product. Um, whether you're doing e-commerce or <coughs> my product is very unique, I have to have that. And I want to enter in a, in, in a special way. So you have to think highly of yourself sometimes. No one has ever sold coffee in Yemen over um, $18 a kilo. And that was considered extremely high in general. Most coffee in the world sold sub $5 a kilo. Then the commercial, the commercial the seat market is 125 a pound. And so if you, if you increase it by cents, buyers get very sensitive by like 5, 10 cents, let alone a dollar more. Uh, and so I, I think it's really cool when you're young and you have no experience because you have the opportunity to fail fast. And my biggest thing is to be able to pivot as much as you can. Your success depends on how much or how fast you can take in data, analyze it, and make decisions and make products and services based on that data. If you can't do that, you're going to be stuck in it. And always try to look at your data and try to collect it. And we live in a place where there's a lot of companies and services that actually help you read your data very accurately. Um, and so, yeah. I wanted to target this market, and then a day before I was supposed to leave, this happened. March 25th, 2015. A civil war broke out in Yemen. Uh, Saudi Arabia began a, a military campaign with 10 other Yemen countries to stop this militia from continuing to spread through the country. They began to take most of the cities. So one night I woke up and I took this picture with my iPhone. Um, and there was this destruction. So <laughs> tried to go to the airport, they bombed both airports, and there's no, there was no way for us to leave. Uh, other countries were evacuating their citizens, like China and Russia and Pakistan and India, but the U.S. government, for some reason, they weren't helping our, uh, their own citizens. The official response from the State Department was, I'm sorry we can't help you, but we can relay your messages to your loved ones via our website. We started a petition with uh, groups like the ACLU and even like local governments here in the city of Richmond, Berkeley, San Francisco, we had protests. Um, we had a website, stuckinyemen.org, and there were thousands of people stuck there. And so what was even, what hurt more was that these weapons that were being used were U.S. made weapons. And they were actually given logistical support to where they target. Um, and so, you, for me, I had a goal of reaching this conference. It was like a week into it. Uh, before the, It was a week before the conference. And logically, looking at things like, you know, you hear these quotes, like really nice quotes on like, you know, thinkexist.com or someone's like Instagram. And my favorite is uh, Albert Einstein, like logic gets you from point A to point B, but imagination gets you anywhere. And so um, sometimes we limit ourselves because of what we think is possible and not possible. I really wanted to go to this conference. Looking at the reality, there was no way to make it out. Um, but I really just, just wanted to push through and figure out a solution. And I think every entrepreneur, there's that per they, they like, most are successful like see into the future. Like when they're telling you their, their their idea, they're not like looking way past you. Like they're already like somewhere in the future and they understand where they need to where they need to be. Maybe they don't know how to get there. Like I'll be honest with you, I did not have this master plan. I didn't know about supply chain management. 
having a business model, having a go-to-market strategy, having a three-year projection of profit and losses. I didn't understand these like concepts until way later. Um, but I had an idea of something I wanted to do and so I, I can do it. So then, I mean, it was pretty bad. This was me like in April of 2015, trying to stay alive. Um, I heard about the port of Mocha, that there were small shipments going out to East Africa. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll try to go there. I got there, we were supposed to take a, a mid-sized ship across to the Red Sea with like 160 passengers from Somalia and like 11 tons of onions, like whatever. Uh, we get to the port, the, the, the boat wasn't working, there was airstrikes the next morning, and it was like the, the window was getting very close to being closed, and so they said there's a small boat. Instead of a three-day journey on the ship, you take a boat called a Viper, and it'll take you one day. I'm like, okay, Viper, I thought Viper. It's like some kind of fast boat. He meant fiber, like fiberglass. So I got there, and there was this little dinghy that was like from here to where you are, with a small single motor, 40 horsepower like, engine on it, which means that if it dies, you're stuck in this ocean. And you hear stories of people from East Africa, or from Syria, going to like Greece, and they people were, were dying, who were being washed along the shores of Italy, and these bodies, and no one, Orson Shire, a wonderful poet, says, like, no one leaves the land to go in the ocean unless they have no choice. And for me, I didn't have a choice. I was like, stay, maybe die, or try to make it to this conference in Seattle. <laughs> um, it's pretty funny saying it, like, this, is, this was my getaway selfie. <laughs> so at, at the time, I didn't like seeing pictures, but I had this reporter who kept telling me, like, you need to just take like, as many pictures as possible. I'm like, look, lady, like, I'm not in a place to do that. I'm going to try to stay alive. But <laughs> so if I take these pictures, it would be really hard to, like, you know, believe that. So when I got to the, I got from, like, I, I remember, like, when I got in the ocean, like, within, like, 30 minutes, I'm in this, like, giant sea, you know, this little piece of wood. And I started to feel like, why did I do, what, why did I put myself in this situation, like, I should just, you know, and I think about my family and my siblings and, like, my friends, and, and so then I remember, um, eventually, like, I made it through to Djibouti, and then from there to Kenya, um, and then when I got to Amsterdam, in Amsterdam, like, I, I called our, my, these lawyers I used to work with, they're like, hey, we're going to have a, a press conference for you, in the United, one reporter, I'm like, all right, cool, so I, I'm going to buy a nice, like, a, like a, tra a blazer. I didn't want to look like a Yemeni Jack Sparrow. <laughs> so I got to the airport and there was all these crazy cameras and I'm like, who's here and what's going on? They all like rushed at me and ended like came out the gate. It was pretty intense. Till today I don't know why I went for this like Amish look. <laughs> <laughs> that happened. Um, so yeah, it was pretty crazy. Like I went on like on NPR and BBC and Democracy wow. Now, Amy Goodman. You know, it was like, it was intense for like two days, and the next day I, I flew and I went to Seattle. And I'm taking my Uber back to my, to the, to, taking the Uber to the conference, and I hear myself on the radio. And the driver, this was like one of the most surreal experiences in my life. Like the driver was like, this guy's really amazing what he's doing, his farmer's helping them, like he's crazy. I'm like, yeah, he's nuts. <laughs> um, and I made it to the conference, and like, what surprised me was I didn't know how good this coffee was, like, in these blind tastings, it won all, like, out all these international coffees. Over and over again, people really wanted it. So now the heart was like, get in quality control, up, get in monthly support. But you're not my, my route to get this product in here. And if you guys, anyone who watch Narcos, okay, so overall it's very similar. How do you get this product, you know, out from this country to you know, where you get it to? And it's very, it's hard because there was no ports at that time. So checking the shipments, that time I had 14 tons that I wanted to get here, you know, um, and so I, they were bombing our roads, but eventually. It came through. Um, I got to see it last year. <laughs> on the man in Port of Oakland right here. Right, from this, one, this, one from the, uh, this was from the Margadero. You know, the social impact was really important to me. Like, getting to do this work, I have to rush through this, but like, they ripped out 14,000 of the drug plant that year. That's one village. And we began to put coffee seeds when I went back that and following in April, a few months later. And it was amazing seeing the look on farmers, you know, who had worked so hard to do something like this. You know, they had, they were, I brought back magazines about them in, and they would look at themselves in these magazines. Um, and yeah, it was great and seeing that our expanded, and we expanded to like, you know, then I went to a fundraising round, and I, you know, took, and I was able to like, um, hire people who actually went to some school and like, um, helped me, help my company scale in the, right, in the right direction that I wanted to go. We went to three other regions, you began to onboard uh, lots of other villages, um, and yeah, it was pretty amazing seeing the coffee go that way. So Blue Bottle was one of our first buyers, and that was pretty crazy. Like, you know, this was James Freeman, the founder, called our copy. Wow. Um, and 
thing in the first week here. So it was crazy because like they paid the highest they had ever paid for coffee, and it, it came out to sixteen dollars per cup. That's how much they charge. And their store they sold out within forty-five days throughout the U.S. Um, from there, we targeted like pretty much any good coffee shop that you guys have. George Howell, Equator, Slate in Seattle, Dragonfly Fly in Colorado, Kutum in Paris. Uh, and our coffee was really interesting how people like. Every copy that miracle gets to us when it does. It crosses borders and cultures and political hardships. And it's amazing the journey it takes to get to us. Um, and then I guess my story was a little more extreme, but it, it, get, it was able to connect to the consumer. If you connect to the consumer in a very intimate way, you create value about something. And so for us, there was two types of products usually, this, or consumer. There's the consumer who wants like me. I want the best, the most high, the highest luxury, the Louis Vuitton, the you know, Bugatti. And then there's the customer who cares about social impact. And so for me, like, I, I want. Usually the more you talk about social impact, the more people think you're trying to overcompensate your product. You want me to feel you know, bad about what's going to be good about buying this product. And that's never a good place to be. You should always lead with quality. So for us, I want people to focus on the quality in market and brand the company around that idea. And that's why it's so powerful having a brand. What are the emotions you want people to feel they need with you at any touch point? You look at any company that's successful, like Apple, you, whatever it is, the Apple store, the box, the website. It's the same colors, the same feelings, um, and you figure that out, and you figure out how to scale your company. And for us, it was like, Yemen was like, going to be our high-end sports car. You know, like Tesla, when they first started, they started with the Roadster, which what they want to do is, was, when people thought about electric cars, the Insight or the Prius, people did not think they were sexy or, or fast or performance-based. They bought this crazy sports car, and that was the thing that helped them get to the point where they are now, mass-producing an amazing product. So you have to have an idea of the, the vision of your company, where you want to go. So my idea was to start this in Yemen, spread through Yemen, change the economy of that country, and then eventually go to other countries, use this platform, um, figure out my market. That's pretty crazy. I'll end with this. Like, and so, and especially the retail index that comes out every quarter, in the second quarter uh, of that year, it jumped 8.1%. And they said, and there was a footnote that said, one copy in particular, the much who Yemen Hussein, our copy, Yemen uh, Hamer Hussein, had that. <coughs> that was the name of the farmer. Sold by Blue Bottle Copy, played an influential role in skewing future numbers upward. The transparent trade group said that if the 173 per pound roasted coffee were moved from the index, it would fall from $24 down to 22 Our little company, our co a copy, changed the index of, that, of the entire specialty coffee market. Billions and billions of dollars. And it's growing at a rapid rate. Um, this is the end of my presentation. I hope that you guys benefited somewhat. I always like the Q&A. I tried to make the Q&A longer session, and I ended up not doing that, sorry. But, no, it's okay. It's just, I just, yeah. So like, um, please ask any questions. The, the more difficult, the better. Um, bam. I was just wondering, so during this time, you were like traveling through Yemen, like traveling to all these places to collect your 21 samples. Like, and obviously, like, you weren't selling anything, making any money. How did you, like, sustain yourself and, like, afford to travel up through all this and, like, keep this up until you started your company? And also, second, uh, where's the nearest place we can get a cup of this coffee? Okay, first question, so I don't come from a lot of money. I grew up in Tenderloin as an oldest of seven children. And so I had a, a couple of investors who gave me some money initially, but I had a group called the MVP, the mobile product, which meant me sleeping on the floor of the villages next to cows and, like, not you spend much money. And so I tried to be as, as economic as possible. Um, when you fundraise, it's very important, and early on, there's a reason why people ask for money. You might have a wonderful idea in your head, but if you can't get the money to begin it, you won't go to get that part. Making sure you take the money from the right people, too, who understand your vision, which is a whole other part of the presentation. But, so that was how I started. Um, and so I got to a point where I had a proven product. So ultimately, you have to be, you have to be in a place where people can support you. You get angel investors. Angel, you know, so that's what I did first. Uh, I didn't get my like, venture capital money until way later. Um, the second thing was, the question was where can you get coffee from? So uh, different coffee shops currently uh, in stores, okay, you can, uh, you can get it in Boston and George Howell copies, you can order it online also. Uh, we actually sell directly to consumers, but we pick, our, we pick the highest end part of our copies and we have like a trilogy or, or a single box. I actually bought one here. Um, which we wanted to we wanted to do a B2B and B2C track 
which sounds interesting. We wanted to serve our coffees with roaster, but co brand with our company. So Blue Bottle will serve it in January. Uh, you have Intelligence here and Burr and a few others later in the fall. But right now, you can buy it um, in these boxes that we developed for online. Um, and basically, it's, it's on our website, portofmocha.com. It's spelled uh, M O K H A. Uh, so I really like this box. Uh, we actually said we hired a company that designed the iPhone box. So this is how it looks like. So we wanted to online sell that as a gift box for people, a high-end gift box. And in store, you, you can buy these uh, roasters that serve it. Any other questions? Uh, when you first started to pursue this career, how did you know it was the right path to take to make social change? Um, you know, I just, I, I believe in the, and uh, I, I saw something. And you know, it's hard to see that I saw something, I had these, it's kind of funny, because of my limited experience, I didn't do things the way people normally do, which means two things. One, you make hell of mistakes, right? The second thing is, uh, because I had a fresh pair of eyes, I did things differently, and those things were, like, no one thought about going from a producer and creating, taking out all the little people and selling directly to the consumer. Uh, no one thought about making, like, a website. Or, you know, when, so we ended up selling our coffee for $150 a kilo. You know, Yemeni coffee farm uh, exported were $50 a kilo. And so, s being new into something, it helps you understand it, it helps you bring innovation, it helps you be disruptive, you can use that word, but I'll use it. Uh, and so, it's, it's actually a, a pro and a con. Yeah, sure. um, so, when you're in America, you're obviously really far away from Yemen. So, how are you able to like assure quality when you're so far away? It's actually really cool. If you guys have a chance, there's actually a you know, podcast by Gimli Media called Startup. I think it's the number one business podcast. And they did like a two month thing about our, um, about our company called Perfect Cup like, a couple of months ago. So, you can, it goes into a lot more detail about like the business side of things. And so the issue for me wasn't scale and production, it was scale and quality. The, the first shipment was, you know, it worked pretty well. The second shipment wanted to scale up quite a bit, um, 4x. But we had a huge problem with that. And so we really had to stop and focus on quality. Uh, I wanted to focus on a high-end product. Eventually I'll have, like, other tiers, you know, because it's a different kind of customer. But in the beginning I wanted to focus on an innovative, amazing product. So, yeah, I have to go to Yemen several times a year. We have an, have an, in the first two years I was in Yemen. I, didn't, I live there, in these mountains. And now I do a lot of you know, marketing and sales, but I'm there in Yemen several times throughout the year. I have an amazing supply chain management team. Um, eventually start bringing people who can do work because you can't do it yourself. You bring people who can, who can be the operation director, the chief financial officer, the chief operating officer. You can, everyone does their part and, they, and you expand and that's how it works out. So find them a great team. If you can find a good team that's worth more than anything. And if that means losing some equity, if you have to do it. Um, build their team and, and people who are going to stay in the long run. I wish I could answer that question more because it's a really good part question, but we'll have to start the, or listen to the podcast so it has more to do that. So, okay, uh, so like, how long did it take for you to like, uh, come from like, starting, like, making that, like, after the change from the hobby to, to your goal until you, your business is <laughs> So I was fortunate when I had good advice from my trusted. It was like, I think six months when I went from the hospital to a goal, going to do this. And then from there, three years, I think two, two and a half, three years. So like, you know, and, in, and right before any success, like I reached the worst part of my life was the boat. Like I'm like, I don't know if I'm, I'm not, let alone, I'm not gonna live, let alone if I'm gonna to work. And all that eventually, you know, worked out the end. Um, but yeah, pivot, figure out your, your thing. And, and if you're not doing that, you, you won't be able to grow. Thank you so much, Jessica. Follow us on Instagram. Do you guys have any more questions? Um, sure, you can stick around for a few minutes and answer them. Um, if not, see you guys next week. And make sure you sign the attendance sheet. It's going around. Who has the attendance sheet? Oh, it's up there. No way. <laughs>